at least since tools like ChatGPT are available to the broad public, it has been a debate how to spot whether AI was used to write a text, or if that's even possible to do reliably. In one of my last videos, we saw how we can hide information in the pixel values of an image, which can later be detected again, a so-called digital watermark. This can then, for example, be used to prove ownership or to discover if an image found in the wild was generated by your own AI. Now, especially for that second case, wouldn't that also be really helpful for generated text? Maybe it could also be used to detect whenever an LLM was used. Hi and welcome to Premature Abstraction. Today we will see how text is watermarked. First, I want to get something out of the way. When text watermarking is discussed, people mostly see it in the context of detecting unpermitted usage of AI. So, for example, for exposing cheating in an essay or to prohibit answers from ChatGPT on Stack Overflow. This then often derails into a conversation about ethics, which I want to avoid on purpose. There are many more reasons why watermarking text is interesting, so let's start with a quick overview. As already mentioned, we may want to detect prohibited use of generated text. Next, LLMs have made it straightforward to produce high-quality spam and scam messages. A watermark which is unknown to such an adversary can be used in a spam filter to better remove those messages. Also due to the widespread success of LLMs, there is more and more generated text publicly available on the internet. The training datasets for LLMs more or less contain all text that the creators could get their hands on, so it will inevitably contain more and more generated text. This holds a risk of model collapse, where a model's biases get reinforced and the overall generation quality decreases. When generated text is watermarked, it can be filtered out before training. Last, some companies go to great lengths to protect classified information from leaking. Still, from time to time, something slips through. And if each employee has received the information with a distinct watermark, it can be traced which employee was the leaker. There is, for example, a famous story from Tesla, where some employees got sent an important confidential email. Every employee received a slightly different one, with each word being separated by either one or two spaces, giving it a distinct signature. When the letter was made public, the leaker could be identified by that, or at least that's how the story goes. Looking at those use cases, we can already think about the properties that such a watermark should have. First, it should cause little distortion, which means that it impacts the quality and accuracy of the watermark text as little as possible. In the context of text generation, this means to influence the predictive capabilities of the language model as little as possible. Initially, this is a rather pragmatic requirement because no one will want to use a language model with high distortion, as its output quality drastically decreases. A related requirement is that the watermark should be hidden, also referred to as secrecy. This is because it would again turn off potential users. Let's take this example where every second letter is capitalized. Here, the attacker can also easily steal the watermarking scheme and apply it to new text, impersonating the LLM and damaging its reputation. Furthermore, it would make removing it a lot more accessible if it is visible to an attacker. Which brings us to the next requirement, which is that the watermark should be difficult to be scrubbed off, which is the robustness property. Not only should it be robust against intentional attacks like exchanging words or cutting off parts, but also against accidental removal. In our earlier example from Tesla, the watermark would, for example, not be robust against some text rendering like HTML, which normalizes white space. So if the leaker had taken a screenshot instead of copy-pasting the mail, there would have been a good chance to accidentally remove the watermark. Generally, the more robust a watermark gets, and the harder it is to detect for an adversary, the harder it will also be to detect for the creator. So another property of a good watermark is when it is still reliably detected, which means avoiding the cases where a watermark's actually there, but it's so weak that it stays unnoticed by the detector. And also we want to minimize the chance of false positives, as this could, for example, lead to students being wrongly accused of cheating. The last requirement is more on the operational side. In general, it would be desirable to be able to add the watermark to any language model when generating text to deploy it broadly. And also we don't want to rely on the user giving specific prompts for our watermark to work, or even know what the prompt was. This is called the agnostic property. So overall, we want our watermark to be as distortion-free, robust, secret, and detectable and agnostic as possible. Now, all of these considerations are all well and good, 
but they seem very hard to achieve. To take the white space example for the last time, sure, the watermark fulfills a lot of the requirements, but it is not very robust. We've already talked about how it may even be removed accidentally, without even mentioning how easy it would be for an adversary that suspects such a scheme. If we are honest, this watermark is actually more like metadata, externally attached to the actual content or meaning of the text. Wouldn't it be way better if we could somehow incorporate the watermark into the text content itself? Then we could even detect the watermark when it is screenshotted, printed, scanned, read aloud and transcribed again, etc. We would somehow need to influence the choice of words of the LLM in such a way that we can detect that only our LLM could have created this exact message. A quick note. In this video, we will mostly focus on watermarking specifically for language models, as this is the most relevant application of text watermarks right now. But later, we will also discuss other types of watermarks that are applicable to a broader category of text. And so that we are all on the same page, a quick refresher on how language models work. The whole idea of a language model is to predict the next words when given a prompt. These words or word fragments are commonly referred to as tokens. To be a bit more specific, we can view the language model as a machine that takes in a sequence of tokens and then predicts a score for each token in its vocabulary. These scores are called logits and the higher they are, the more the model thinks this token should come next. Notice that they are all negative, so be mindful what low and high means. The logits are then normalized with a specific function to map to probabilities. And from that probability distribution, we can then sample the next token or simply take the most likely one. There are multiple strategies possible here. Then, the original prompt with the new token is used as input again, and the cycle repeats. There is a lot more to talk about when it comes to language models. But for watermarking, this is actually already enough info to discuss the most prevalent schemes. A very influential idea, and kind of the most central work in this field, is the watermarking scheme from Kirchenbauer, Gaping and colleagues from the University of Maryland. The paper was published in 2023, so everything we talk about here is very recent work. We will build some intuition first and then discuss it in detail. An initial idea may be to ban the model from using specific words. Let's call this list of banned tokens the red list. The remaining tokens are the green list. We implement this by setting the probabilities for those tokens to zero in the model's output distribution. When a text now contains red words, we know that it's not from our model. And that a long text only contains green words by chance is very unlikely. So we know it is from our model. However, you may already suspect that this has a big impact on the quality of the text when the model cannot use specific words at all. It will be, for example, very hard for an LLM to produce good results when it is not allowed to use common words like the and I. A better approach is when we determine this red list for each previous token differently. We take the last token of the current prompt and derive a rule on how to partition the vocabulary into the red and green list from that. That way the model still has the chance to choose all tokens at some point. But how can we partition our vocabulary based on a previous token? It's actually pretty simple. We hash the token, use the output as a seed for a deterministic random number generator and partition the vocabulary based on that. It also does not need to be split into two equal parts. We can introduce a parameter gamma, which corresponds to the proportion of the size of the green list. So we can split, for example, 40, 60, or 90, 10. Overall, with this strategy, we can always build the same red list when given the same token. This also has the nice side effects that at no point we rely on the underlying language model for our watermark. So it is transferable to other models and there is no model access required when detecting the watermark. Let's see how this procedure works now as a whole. The model gets a prompt and predicts the logits. We hash the last token of the prompt, feed it into a random number generator, and partition the vocabulary into a red and green list. We ban all tokens that are on the red list. Lastly, a token is chosen based on the probabilities of the remaining ones, and this repeats then. And how would we detect the watermark now? Let's take a simple case with two words. Based on the first word, we can calculate the red list and check if the second word is on it. If that's the case, it is an indication that the text is not watermarked because our LLM wouldn't have generated this word. 
However, if the word is on the green list, it may be watermarked. Of course, it could also be that it was manipulated, so we're not done yet. The evidence is not enough. Let's also consider the next word. The same rules apply. If it's a red word, it's getting less likely that the text is watermarked, and more likely when it's a green word. At some point, we encountered so many green tokens that we are sure that this cannot be a coincidence anymore. There is a systematic approach to this, namely using a hypothesis test, the one proportion Z test to be exact. For this, we calculate a Z statistic, in our case via this formula. Here, T is the number of tokens in the text. G is how many of those are on the green list and gamma we already know to be the relative size of the green list. Under some assumptions, we know how this Z statistic is distributed and can therefore infer a p-value from that. So we can say, for example, that we want to limit the p-value to be at most 0.003%, for which the z-score must be at least 4. This then corresponds to us detecting a watermark, even though there actually is none, with only a probability of at most 0.003% in the case where we measure z to be at least 4. Using this approach, we can limit the probability of false accusations, which is far more important than missing a watermark every once in a while. This approach also plays nicely with mitigating scrubbing attacks on our watermarked text. If some green words are replaced with red words, this only impacts our detection capabilities by a bit. So as long as not the whole text is paraphrased, there is a high chance that the watermark will stay. We will not go deeper into the topic of hypothesis testing here. The important thing is that we can set a minimum z-score that our scheme must adhere to so that we can still confidently detect a watermark. Now this is all well and good, but our scheme has one major flaw, namely that it may be possible that certain combinations of words are banned. Let's take for example the token Sherlock. It is very likely to be followed by the word Holmes. But if we are unlucky and the word Sherlock sets Holmes on the red list, we will never generate that combination of words, which degrades the text quality. More generally, if a sequence of words is predictable, we say that it has low entropy. It would be better if we could somehow systematically avoid embedding the watermark into text passages with low entropy. Until now, we completely banned red tokens from being generated. That's why it was called the hard watermark. But what if we would just make the green tokens a bit more likely instead? This is then called the soft watermark, and it's also very simple. After the model generates the logits for the next token, a constant delta is added to all green tokens. This delta is also referred to as the hardness parameter, it makes the green token slightly more likely to be generated while still allowing all word combinations at each step. The higher the delta, the stronger the model is biased toward green words, making the watermark easier to detect later. Notably, this method is less likely to embed the watermark in low entropy sections, where the sequence is highly predictable and the probability distribution has a dominant peak that overshadows any perturbations caused by the delta. In contrast, in high entropy sections with more uniform token distributions, the watermark can more effectively influence specific choices without being noticeable. And how well does this soft watermark work now? In their paper, they analyzed that watermarks on text with as few as 25 tokens can already be reliably detected. And if the text is sufficiently long, like 200 tokens, the chance of the detector missing a watermark is also very small, at about 1.6%. If you're interested in detailed results, you should take a look at the paper yourself. They go into great lengths how well their watermark works when the text has low or high entropy, what parameters work well, which sampling strategy is best, and how much the text quality is impacted. Still, one major limitation for this and related watermarks is the overall entropy of the underlying text. There are certain tasks like reciting something word for word or coding, which are notorious to have very low entropy. So here it is inherently harder to add a strong watermark. All this analysis is of course under the assumption that the watermark itself is not attacked and there are numerous possible attacks on watermarks. The most obvious one would be to just rephrase everything a language model produces. Of course, this does not really scale well when a human does the rephrasing and when another LLM does it, it's either watermarked as well, or it could have been used in the first place to generate the text without a watermark. Also, only rephrasing a few passages is not enough either, as merely a few sentences or sentence fragments are enough to trigger detection. A related attack is to do a round trip of translations into different languages, but this may keep many words intact, 
and also degrade text quality. An attacker can also throw off the computation of the hash function by using small alterations like typos, additional white space, or different spellings of words. Of course, it would be necessary to add those alterations to most of the text, which severely impacts text quality. And it's mitigated effortlessly by normalizing the text before running the detector. Next, in the Unicode standard, there are many letters which look the same. For example, the letter I looks exactly the same in Cyrillic. When the attacker exchanges the letters, this breaks the watermark too. A mitigation would again be to normalize the text. This attack can also be used in reverse, where you tell the LLM that it should always use the Cyrillic I in the output, and you change it back to the regular one. Another funny idea is the so-called emoji attack. The idea is to instruct the LLM to put emojis before each word. The emojis can be systematically removed afterwards, which throws off the watermark detector. Each emoji always created the same red list of tokens, but now each remaining word has a different predecessor, and so a randomized red list. By the way, they also showed this example in the paper, and for me it's the first time I've seen a tweet being cited. These are all ways to try to remove the watermark, but there is another category of attacks called spoofing. The idea is to somehow extract the watermarking scheme and apply it to different text. This can then, for example, be used to cause reputational harm to the original LLM provider. So for a while now, there is an arms race ongoing between people trying to come up with better watermarks and others who try to break it. Let's get a quick overview. One central problem in the discussed watermarking scheme is that there is a fundamental trade-off between the watermark detectability and the impact on the text quality. A scheme which circumvents this trade-off is from this paper. Their watermarking scheme is distortion-free, so it does not affect the model's prediction distribution. At the same time, the watermark is generated with a secret key and can provably only be detected when the key is known. Of course, there is no free lunch and they buy these guarantees with a slower detection speed. Write a comment if you want me to make a video going deeper into that scheme, it's also very interesting. In an abstract sense though, the two watermarking schemes are quite similar, primarily because they affect the choice of words in the last step of inference. There are of course also completely different approaches. Let's start with linguistic watermarks. The idea here is that the LLM gets a specific style of writing which makes it recognisable, kind of like people can recognise a Shakespeare text from the way it is written. Also the ones which I would call accidental watermarks fall under this category. Last year there were some stories that ChatGPT really likes to use the word delve. Or maybe a bit too on the nose, there are numerous reports of papers that contain the literal words as a large language model. There is also a tool called GPT-0, which claims to detect AI-generated text. But in the end, it only detects such linguistic markers, such as perplexity and burstiness, which makes it not reliable enough to prevent false accusations. Another interesting approach, especially regarding the minimal text alterations it causes, is the AWT scheme. It works similar to GANs. Very broadly speaking, the idea is to train a transformer network in an adversarial fashion to incorporate a binary string into the message. This way, the optimal concealment of the watermark inside the text is learned, which results in few necessary changes to the text. So this scheme fits into a broader category of learned watermarks. Last, Early iterations also suggested rule-based watermarks where common words are replaced with synonyms. However, in the end, these are just less powerful than the ones we already discussed. But on the other side, there are also very successful attack strategies. A very recent iteration is this paper where they were able to steal the watermark of an LLM by just querying the API. And they did not even need a lot of resources to do that. They claim that they only spent an equivalent of $50 with an 80% success rate of either stealing or scrubbing the watermark. This is alarming news because many regulators are already counting on watermarking being reliable as the first laws requiring watermarking are coming into effect. As we move forward, it's clear that watermarking isn't a silver bullet, but rather a cat and mouse game between security and adversarial attacks. So in conclusion, the whole topic is extremely relevant and a very active field of research, with new attacks and new ideas coming up on a regular basis. It's an exciting space to watch, with new developments and ideas emerging all the time. This has been Premature Abstraction. Thank you for watching.